Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Falconer. I work down here in Houston and we will be doing the trauma overview lecture today. As it says in the title, overview means that this is a broad lecture. We will be talking about a few specifics, but in general, this is the overview, which means that a lot of the lectures might have some repetitive parts to it that you're going to be working with other faculty, other podcasts, other videos, and other assignments in this module. Therefore, give me a little break if you happen to hear these things over and over again. Hopefully that just means that you will remember it. I also want to apologize to those of you out there who are emergency medicine nurses or who have worked in the emergency department. Um, a lot of this stuff is going to be repeat, but it's really important that we all start this on the same page and we're all coming at it from a new perspective. So let's get started. The trauma evaluation all comes from and spawns from the world wars and the military because that's where it all started. That's where all of the trauma was at the time. It was young, in shape men who were getting shot or killed or stabbed or whatever it was that was happening. So this is a typical patient that we would see in the trauma bays at a random hospital. Notice that this patient is coming in as a motor vehicle collision uh, patient from EMS. The patient was ejected and unrestrained and they just put them here, what do you do? So the first thing to notice about this patient is that you see that the clothes aren't all the way off. You also see that his head is taped to the board. You see the breathing mask on his face, as well as the fact that he's got something that looks like blood on his chin, but you can't quite tell. You also see that there are two bones sticking out of his legs, both of them in a very similar pattern and at a very suspicious level in his legs. You also notice that his legs are taped down to the board in some way, kind of indicating that there might be some sort of fracture there or need for stabilization. So this approach to trauma evaluations is important to know because in the military and in the world wars, what we noticed is that really smart people, even in really chaotic environments can tend to forget things, which is why the trauma evaluation is almost always a serial assessment. And it's the same thing on every single patient. This is why a lot of the older providers tend to get really bored of trauma because it's the same thing on every patient every time. This ensures that we don't miss anything, but it tends to get a little bit boring after a while. But it's also great for beginners because it means that if you can know what the assessment is and what the next step is, we can always go somewhere with it. So each box is a assessment. So you see that we start with a primary survey and we go through the entire primary survey. If you get to something that needs to be fixed, then you stop the survey, you fix the problem, and then you start all over again. So if you get to A, B, C, D, and you need to fix D, then you have to start all over again at A, okay? So once you get through the primary survey, you fix all of the problems there and you can get through it all um, completely without hitting some sort of thing that needs to be fixed, that's when you move on to the secondary survey. Then you start all over again. The secondary survey needs to be completed from head to toe all the way down. And if you hit something that needs to be fixed, you got to start over again. And if you can get all the way through the secondary survey, only then can you move on to the tertiary survey. I think you get the picture here. And I think you understand the importance that we stick with a algorithmic approach to trauma. So that way we all don't forget anything in the chaos of what's happening in the trauma base. So let's go into this a little bit in depth. The first concern that a lot of people don't talk about and medical students, nurses, nursing students, providers, everybody gets really concerned about being in the way because there's such a chaos happening in the trauma bay that you need to know where to be, where to stand. And Typically, this picture here, which I did find on the internet, is tendency to be where everybody generally tends to stand. Notice that the team leader or the person who is running and just making all of the decisions is at the foot of the bed. They're labeled team leader. 
any of the other assistant doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, whatever else, they're going to be on the sides of the bed and or the head of the bed. Okay. This is a really important thing to notice because if you're the one making all decisions, if you're running this trauma, you're not doing the procedures. You are not doing the intubation. You are not even necessarily physically laying hands on the patient, except to quickly, briefly glance over something to make sure you understand what the next step is. If you want to be the person who's doing the procedures or who's necessarily asking all the questions or getting all of the medicine or whatever it is, notice that that means you're not going to be running this trauma. Okay. That being said, let's move on from there. This next step is all about the ABCs of trauma. This is the most fundamental piece of medicine. And as such, I'm sure you guys already know, and you've heard of the ABCs. However, we have to make sure everybody knows about it and you need to understand all the differences. We're gonna be going into all of those in this lecture, but I also want you to know that one of the key pieces of the ABCs is that this is an excellent way to evaluate a patient in any chaotic situation, even if you're not in the trauma bay. So that means if you get called to a code on the floor, you don't know what's happening, everything is chaos. The very first thing that should go through your head out of habit is the ABCs. If you're riding a plane and somebody calls for a medical provider and you don't know what to do, you don't know what's happening, the very first step that you should always do, go to the ABCs. It's the secret of all medicine and it'll always make sure that you hit all of the most important topics. So remember that the ABCs isn't necessarily just trauma, but it is the very first step of trauma. Okay, that being said, the ABCs, are a little bit harder than we learned in kindergarten because there's a lot of assessment that goes into each one of these and there's a lot of management that can go into each one of these. I also want you to know that while we're separating it out to A, B, C for you to go through in your mind, when you get used to this and you go through it a lot, a lot of times A, B, and C is happening all at one time. D and E are happening all at one time. So a lot of times the emergency room or the trauma bay looks like a chaos mess because one nurse is cutting off all of the clothes while the other nurse is putting them on the um, fluids or getting in an IV and they're, they're doing things all together um, all at one time. But remember that if you're the leader, you got to go through it A, B, C, D, E. Okay. So let's go into some of the differences here. The first is airway and breathing. And a lot of people get these confused. They don't know what the difference is. So I want to clarify that for you. Airway is the physical hole in your nose and your mouth. It's the physical part. So the airway is the physical tubes that get you air. In trauma, it's very possible that those tubes are not intact. So you can tell that by either listening to the lungs or looking at the patient's face. So one of the first steps that you can do is look for an obstruction. And in case this isn't very obvious to you, here's a picture of an airway obstruction that is not looking great, okay? This is not a breathing problem. This is an airway problem. You can see that his teeth are coming out of his chin. You can bet that if there's that much damage, his jaw is probably not in place. And you can also notice that from this picture, this person is probably not safe to intubate orally, okay? So from there, we need to move on to suction, positioning, and oxygen. Remember that this patient doesn't always need to be intubated as long as their suction, position, and oxygen are doing okay. So at least for the moment, you can continue your evaluation before you jump immediately to intubation. Here is an example of suction, position, and oxygen. This person is awake and on the tippy top scale of should I intubate or should I not? What do you think? But I would at this point just continue my evaluation. So you can see that suction position and oxygen might significantly help this patient. Next is, as the picture shows, impending airway problems. Impending airway problems are going to result in things like a chest tube or things like intubation. It's always going to be a procedure. 
Remember that impending airway problems don't always have to be on the face. The airway includes the lungs, as this picture shows here. Look at that big cut or stab wound, or I'm not exactly sure what that is, but that person has an open chest wound. That is an impending airway problem because their lung is either already down or it's developing a pneumothorax as they breathe in and out. So this is not just a airway face, mouth, nose problem. This is a chest or even a back problem. So always think of that as when you're doing your airway assessment. Next is going to be breathing. And that is simply the act of breathing and oxygenating. So the muscles and the chest rise, are they taking a breath? Okay. The easy answer is if they are taking a breath, then you need to also relook for impending airway problems that might involve listening on their chest to heart and lung sounds. You know, do you hear something that could sound like a pneumothorax where one side sounds like good breath sounds and the other side sounds like you can't hear anything at all? Or maybe like you've discovered this weird sucking chest wound that needs a chest tube. If there is some kind of impending airway problem, and I would also include strider or tiring in this whole pathway. So that means that right now there isn't a problem, but they're looking pretty COPD tripoding. They're starting to get striderous or they're starting to tire out. They're having a lot of work of breathing. Then you're gonna go ahead and intubate and remember the C-spine, okay? If they're not taking a breath, obviously you need to intubate and we need to figure out why they're not. Um, one of the cheap, easy ways to determine whether somebody has airway or breathing intact really quickly is to walk into the room and say, hello, sir, or hello, madam. And if they start talking to you, at least you know that their airway is intact currently and their breathing is good because in order to be able to talk, you have to have both. Remember that you're still not out of the woods as far as making sure that there's no impending airway problems because there still could be a problem, but it just hasn't imploded yet. All right, let's look at the chest x-rays. Remember that if you're walking into a trauma, one of the first things that you're gonna do besides trying to get them to talk is you're also gonna get a portable chest x-ray. Notice that there's some big changes here. In the picture that is labeled A, you can see that everything looks kind of normal. Um, and this picture A is probably what was the first picture when somebody came into the emergency department. It's not always very obvious what is happening, but you can see from this line here that that is an actual small pneumothorax. Um, so you can see the difference in the chest wall versus the lung. B is when nobody noticed and it continued to get worse. Here is the lung now. And you can see it has significantly improved or I'm sorry, it has significantly deflated and gotten worse. So you can see that there are lung uh, markings on the outside airways here. You can see that there are still lung markings out here, but there are completely no lung markings out here. Okay. And then when nobody still failed to notice for some weird reason, the last one is this right here is the lung completely collapsed. And hopefully that is very obvious to you because we don't want to see that in chest x-ray if we can help it. And that's why we do a chest x-ray very early because this is a airway breathing problem, which is in the A and B section of our map here. So here is what a pneumothorax looks like on a CT scan. You can see the air outside of the lung. That doesn't look very good. And then you can see what it looks like with a chest tube on the inner side of the x-ray. So going to move on from there. What about this? This is an airway breathing situation. But what you notice is that there's lung markings on all of the outside areas. Okay, those are those little tree branchy white pieces you can see that kind of come out here. But what I do see on this chest x-ray is this kind of really obvious line around the heart that's black, that's indicating me air. And you can also see on this area and this area 
that there's black underneath the diaphragm. That's air under the diaphragm. And that means that somebody has some perf bowel. So that's a immediate surgical indication to take them to surgery. I would maybe go ahead and get out the fast. Um, you just need to be able to recognize that there is definitely a problem there. Uh, next is a widened mediastinum. You can tell here that the aorta is gonna be up at the top and this widened mediastinum, which is this area here, actually is gonna show wide. And it's wide because the aorta has been torn from the heart and that's called an aortic rupture. You have maybe an hour to save this patient's life. Uh, a lot of these patients don't do very well at all. So this is something to recognize and know how big of a deal it is. Next is if you order a chest x-ray, you're responsible for the entire chest x-ray, which means that the lungs in this one are doing okay. What you're noticing about this is, oh, hey, look, there is a clavicular fracture and there's something else. Can you see it? The answer, at least on this particular one, is that this person has subcutaneous air in the soft tissues on the left side. Do you see the air? It's highlighted right here. Air in the subcutaneous tissues almost always means that somebody has a pneumothorax that is too small to see on this particular chest x-ray. Notice that this person also has multiple rib fractures right here, which probably also points towards the facts that they have a pneumothorax. They could even have flail chest, which is something that I would be looking for on physical exam. Oops. So when we're talking about life threats that are present in A and B, we're thinking tension pneumothorax, we're thinking sucking chest wound, like an open pneumothorax to the air. We're thinking massive hemothorax, which is going to be blood in the lung, right? We're also thinking about flail chest. That's got to be more than three ribs. We're thinking about airway or neck swelling. And because remember that could swell and completely close off that airway. And we're also touching for crepitus in the chest and neck. And if you don't know what crepitus is, crepitus feels like um, air under the skin, I would almost say it, it feels like somebody put bubble wrap under a towel. Uh, it's kind of crass, but that's kind of the best way I can describe it. The chest x-ray that you're looking at here on the slide is one of the most impressive chest x-rays I've ever seen. Notice how much black is in the skin. This is all air underneath the skin. This person looks like the freaking Michelin man. And you can see that they already have a chest tube in place, which does not seem to be doing its job because there is air under this skin everywhere. I bet this person felt like snap, crackly pop as you touch them. They were probably starting to complain of skin or all over body pain at this point. All right. Next, we also have to talk about C-spine and airway. And a lot of people say, well, why do we care about C-spine and airway? Shouldn't that be in the neuro section? And the answer is because of the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve, if we get the C-spine out of line, is going to snap. And the phrenic nerve is what keeps the diaphragm alive. I learned in medical school, C345, which are the cervical nerves, keep the diaphragm alive. It rhymes, it's pretty cool, it's easy to remember, but this is the reason why we care about C-spine alignment, especially when we're doing something like intubation. Remember that that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to keep the seat collar on. You can actually open up the seat collar as long as somebody is holding the neck in place and doesn't let it move when somebody is trying to intubate because people tend to have a tendency to kind of yank up on somebody's neck when they're intubating. Next is gonna be C for circulation or vascular status. And what we're gonna do from here is just ask a simple question. Is there a pulse? This should be a pretty easy answer because the, if the answer is no, we're gonna start ACLS. And I think you know that 
from a nurse standpoint. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And if the answer is yes, there is a pulse, then the big question is what are the other vital signs that we care about? Are they hypertensive? Are they tachycardic or are they both? In the setting of trauma, hypotension almost always means some kind of bleeding problem. So we need to stop a hemorrhage. We need to look around and see if we see something bleeding on the floor or bleeding on the bed. And we need to stop that hemorrhage with some kind of pressure, some kind of tourniquet or some other way to stop that hemorrhage. Okay. If however, they're just simply tachycardic or maybe they're kind of both. We also need to, at the same time, be starting an IV. Now, remember, you're the leader of this expedition or this trauma bay. So you're not starting the IV. You're making sure that some nurse is starting the IV. The number of traumas that I have gone into or codes even where everybody just stands and stares is a lot. So sometimes it takes somebody to say, hey, why don't you over there? Let's get an IV kit. And remember, you don't want to spend a very long time on trying to get an IV. If two nurses are trying to get an IV and they take longer than five to six minutes or less sometimes to get an IV, don't play around. Either put in a central line, put in an IO and continue going down the ABCs. You don't want to sit around and twiddle your thumbs or go look something up. You want to have this IV in minutes, okay? And preferably sooner than five minutes. You also want to start thinking in circulation about fluid or blood resuscitation, and you also want to start thinking about pain management. Remember that not all hemorrhages are going to show, and if they're starting to be really hypotensive and tachycardic, at least starting a liter of normal saline can be life-saving sometimes. Now, I've got to talk a little bit about some massive transfusion protocol. So this picture is from the movie, The Shining, in case you guys don't know, but um, massive transfusion protocol is defined by needing over 50% of their blood volume. So in an adult, that's gonna be like two or three liters of blood. If they're requiring multiple transfusions, you need to go ahead and activate massive transfusion protocol. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, how do you know when they come in if they're gonna need massive transfusion protocol? And the answer is if they're a trauma and they're tachycardic and hypotensive and look like shit, activate it. I'd rather activate it and not need it than ending up needing it and not having activated it. So remember that for trauma, we're gonna do O negative for females because we don't know who's pregnant and who's not. And we're gonna use O positive for males because we're starting to run out of O negative blood. So we want to risk the, the positive um, for males because usually it's not a terrible reaction. Remember also that we're not going to necessarily do a type and screen or a type and match. You can order it, but we don't care about that right now. We're going to use emergent release blood. A lot of times you have to sign a lot of paperwork for that. So you may need to tell the nurses, hey, emergent release blood. I'm sure you probably know that. The worrisome thing about massive transfusion protocol that you always have to be aware of is that you can cause worsening acidosis. If you put in too much blood, there's something called citrate actually in the blood packages to try to prevent the blood from clotting and trying to kind of preserve it. And if you put in too many blood packets, that citrate can build up, which can cause acidosis. It can also cause calcium if this person is for some reason getting calcium to precipitate which means we have to be very careful about giving LR to somebody who is getting a lot of blood. We also want to be aware because if you're giving like five and six and seven units of packed red blood cells, that can cause their blood to become very thick. Yes, they were anemic and they were bleeding out, but remember that blood isn't just packed red blood cells. There's also a whole bunch of um, platelets in there and there's also a whole bunch of plasma in there. So we want to make sure that we cover that. All of that being said, the big balance of blood products has been a debate with the surgeons for such a long time. Most people have an acceptable ratio of packed red blood cells to FFP to platelets. And um, there's two kind of big schools of thought on that right now. The first is a one to one to one. So if you're activating massive transfusion protocol for every one packed red blood cell, you're going to order one FFP and one platelet. However, a lot of people are now turning towards the 211 because you should be able to give one unit of blood for free. And if they still require more, then you order the second unit and then you start ordering FFP and platelets. So 
there's going to be a lot of debate on that. I'm not going to go into it, but just know that you want to use a balanced approach to massive transfusion. You don't want to give just red blood cells. You also should know that there is something out there called whole blood, which you can use, but again, not going to get into that. One of the biggest things I want you to be aware of is one unit of packed red blood cells equals about one point of hemoglobin. That's not true with just massive transfusion. It's true with everybody. So think of one unit of packed red blood cells as one point of hemoglobin. So if their hemoglobin is five, you probably want to give more than one unit, right? I mean, you know that, right? Anyway, we also care in circulation about the pelvis x-ray. Why on earth would we care about the pelvis x-ray in our circulation section? Well, you already know that they're going to be at bedside and they're going to be taking that chest x-ray. So some people are going to ask for a pelvic x-ray. And the reason is because of pelvic fractures. You can see here that there is a fracture and that these don't meet up. So one of my secrets for looking at pelvis x-rays is to follow the line or the circle. And you say, oh, look, it doesn't connect. Okay. And then you follow this line and you're like, oh, yep, definitely. This person has a pelvis that is broken. When a pelvis breaks, because it's a ring, it almost always breaks in two places. And because of this, there's going to be a lot of sharp edges. And what runs right here that happens to be the femoral artery and the femoral vein. And boy, those suckers get cut. Remember that they don't run just on top of the leg, but they actually dive deep and connect to the aorta right here. So that means if there's any fractures in this area, the bone is going to slice open the inside part of that femoral artery and femoral vein. And you can and do bleed out and die from that, which we don't want. So let's follow this um, other x-ray over here. You can see that for some reason they're highlighting this transverse process fracture, which is hilarious because uh, this person has a really terrible pelvic fracture. So if you follow this here, you can say, oh, oh, I hit it. I hit a line. Okay. So this right here is broken and this one looks okay, but oh, there it is. That one's broken. And look, you can see that's broken there. Oh, look, and that's broken there. Oh gosh. And even that's broken right there. So you see that this person has multiple pelvic fractures. And remember that that um, femoral vein runs and artery runs right here, which happens to be along the lines of multiple fracture points. So I would be really worried that the second person might have a femoral arterial bleed. Now, what do we do with that? Usually you can activate IR for embolization or you can have the surgeons take this patient to surgery. Oops. So in the cardiovascular assessment, we're gonna take a look at the patient. We're looking for external hemorrhaging. We're looking for color, level of consciousness and cap refill. You'll notice that a lot of the doctors who run codes and who run um, traumas are gonna walk down to the feet of the patient and touch them. A lot of people say that if they have cap refill in their feet, they've gotta have perfusion in the other areas of their body. You're also gonna feel, we're gonna look for things like dorsalis pedis pulse, radial pulse, femoral pulse, and carotid. Notice that I've included numbers by those. Many of you may know this, but many of you may not. If a person has a dorsalis pedis pulse, their systolic blood pressure has to be at least 90 to get blood all the way down to your feet in the dorsalis pedis. So if you feel that artery on the very, very top of the person's foot and they have a pulse, you know that their systolic blood pressure is typically 90 or above. So you're probably good to go. If you can't feel a pulse in either of the feet, then that either means that you have a femoral artery laceration or you've got such a low blood pressure that they can't perfuse those feet. And then the last is you need to know what the monitor is telling you. So if somebody has tachycardia and hypotension, that means shock. And in the terms of trauma, it's gonna be hemorrhagic shock. Now, if they're just tachycardic and they're either normotensive or hypertensive, maybe from the pain or who knows what, you probably have some anemia going on. That's why they're tachycardic. Or they could be in just a crap ton of pain because their leg's been ripped off, right? 
either way, if you're normal tensive or hypertensive, you have a little bit of time to discover what's going on because your body is handling the pressure. So don't treat any trauma patient for hypertensive. I don't care if they're 220 over 180. That's probably a good thing for right now. Next is if they're low in both. If they're hypotensive and they're bradycardic, both of them are depressed. That's something called Cushing sign. And that means they probably have bleeding in the brain. So that's another little fun handy dandy tip to know. Remember that this is in the context of trauma though. That's not all the time. So the big life threats in C are gonna be hemorrhagic shock, tachyarrhythmias, especially VTAC, right? Cardiac tamponade, which is what this picture is showing. Notice that we can get the thoracotomy out and open up the chest cavity and look for the hole in the heart, which you're seeing at the very, very tip. It looks like somebody got stabbed. We also have direct cardiac damage, like stabbing the heart, or you can have an aortic rupture, which means you need to go in and you need to clamp that aorta off to try to save the person's blood flow to the brain and upper part of their body. So I think we're almost done with C here, except my very last tidbit. And this is a personal pet peeve of mine. And it's also for those of you ever out there who have worked with EMS. EMS and so many of us put on tourniquets. And I want you to understand that a tourniquet puts a lot of pressure on an artery. So that way an artery cannot flow. So the whole idea is it's putting pressure, not against itself, but against the bone inside the skin. So if you look at this picture here, you can tell that this person is putting a tourniquet on the forearm, trying to explain how to use the tourniquet. I've seen plenty of people who have done this. Maybe the bleed is right down here. So if the bleed is down there and you put the tourniquet on here, you're not gonna be able to control the bleeding. Why? The answer is in this skeleton right here. Notice that there are two bones in the forearm and there are also two bones in the lower leg. So if you have two bones and you're squeezing it, those two bones don't squish together, which means that the artery will be squished and it'll go in, it'll be pushed in between those two bones, okay? But it'll still be able to pump out the bottom, which means that you can only put a tourniquet on things like hands and fingers, but you can also put one on the upper arm and that will stop the blood flow. But putting one on the lower arm, like the forearm or the lower leg, because both of those have two bones, will not result in adequate tissue hypoperfusion. It won't be able to stop all of the blood flow to that area, which does mean that it'll be less painful for the patient, but it also means that they might bleed out still. So you should know that. Next, let's move on to disability. Now, disability, think of it as neuro, right? Disability is all about the P's. A lot of people call it the pupils, the presence, the pain, and the puncture. So you're looking for puncture wounds. You're looking to see how much pain the person is in or if they feel pain. You're looking at their pupils. Always do that even if the patient is unconscious. And then of course the presence. Are they aware? Are they speaking? Do they know what's happening, right? So our very first step is gonna be our GCS score. This is important in trauma. But remember that if this person is up and talking to you and saying, my leg, it's been ripped off. Oh my gosh. They're not going to talk to you about the president, right? You're not going to do alert and orientation questions. You're going to probably be able to say this person is with it enough to be a GCS of 13 or more because they're aware of what's happening. So GCS really applies to either your altered patient or your, you're not acting right or your unconscious patient. So here's your GCS in case you don't already know it. And I'm assuming of course that you do because I know this is taught in nursing school, but I also want you to know that you gotta have this memorized because we use this every time a trauma comes in or every time we have somebody who is altered or unconscious. And of course, anybody with a GCS of eight, we intubate. So eight or less, we're gonna intubate. 
Next is we wanna get a quick and dirty neuro exam. Now we're gonna talk about neuro in a different area way later, but the quick and dirty neuro exam is what really matters. So you wanna get a pupillary exam. You wanna know if they're big, little, fixed, dilated, what the problem is, right? You wanna know all about their pupils, you want to have a GCS score if they're unconscious. You want to be able to say whether they're oriented or have the presence of mind to know what's happening if they're awake. Sometimes that might be a, just a GCS score, right? And then if they're confused or altered, you're going to want to know AEIOU tips because that is your differential for when they're confused or altered. And we can talk about that in a different section also. Um, I would highly encourage that everybody in disability get a finger stick glucose, especially if somebody is acting very altered. You want to think about intoxication. Just because they're high on PCP doesn't mean that they need a head CT always, right? And then, of course, if there's some kind of extremity problem, you want to make sure you do a neurovascular exam distal to the injury. So if it's an arm injury, you want to take a neurovascular exam of the fingers. If it's a leg injury, you want to do a neurovascular exam of the toes, etc. And then finally, we're going to add in C-spine and paralysis evaluation. Now, here's some pictures of the pupils and here's why we care. Some of these pupil pictures have fancy words. So notice that meiosis is a tiny little word. So it's a tiny little pupil. If you have a tiny little pupil and it's really, really tiny, you will notice how distinctly tiny it is. That's probably something that needs Narcan. If you have medriasis, which is a very long, big word, medriasis means that you can barely even see the color of their eyes, not because they're brown or dark, but because their eyes are so big and wide. Almost all of those are caused by some kind of toxicology problem or brain death. Okay. Um, one of the most famous toxicology problems is GHB or the date rape drug that causes huge pupils. And the most important one is a blown pupil. And again, I know I'm sure that you guys learned this in nursing school, but you can see that it means one side is unreactive. So if you shine a bright light in this eye and you shine a bright light on this eye, you can see that these two eyes are different sizes. And I'm not just talking like, mm, barely, maybe let's look harder. It's like, no, they're significantly different. This almost always means uncle herniation and not uncle like aunt and uncle, uncle like the brain uncus. So if you have something like a head bleed, as is shown in this picture, it puts pressure on the bottom part of the brain. And that bottom part of the brain pressure is going to push this tiny little process on the brain, which is located right here. It's going to push it out and in out the hole of the skull and it's going to push it down and it's going to cause a herniation. When that herniates, it's going to push on this very first cranial nerve that's coming out of the brain stem right here. And that one happens to control cranial nerve three. It's all about your pupils. So an unequal pupil is being pushed on by a part of the brain that's herniating because there's bleeding going on in the skull. I hope that is very clear to you. If not, there's tons of videos on YouTube about it. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about it again later in this section. Um, here's a little bit on brain bleeds. Here's a picture of all the different kinds of brain bleeds you can have and how they look on a CT scan. Notice that the CT scan has the highest sensitivity within the first six hours. And I'm not talking about trauma even, I'm talking about within the first six hours of the bleed. So if it's a headache, if it's whatever it is, the first six hours are the best bleed that you can find because it's still going to be bright white. Older bleeds are going to be darker, maybe more black, and that's how we can tell whether it's an acute bleed or an old bleed. Now, this um, comparison is probably pretty familiar to you guys, but it is tested on so many of the tests, not just by the ones that we give, but by boards exams and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people get confused if it's epidural or subdural. And so 
an epidural is going to be a young person, usually a trauma, and usually they have a transient loss of consciousness. So they're fine, fine, fine. And then all of a sudden they go unconscious and then they kind of wake back up and then they kind of go unconscious. That's going to be the lime or the lemon. And then the subdural is going to be the banana. This is going to be a venous bleed, whereas the epidural is a arterial bleed. The venous bleed can go on a lot longer. Often it's due to anticoagulation. And remember that older people's brains are a little bit atrophied. They're a little shrunk. So those bridging veins that kind of hold up the, the brain, they're really easy to break. And so that can cause this slow venous subdural bleed. So now let's move on to exposure. Exposure isn't just about clothes off and rolling, right? We need to expose the skin. Sorry, that's my dog. And look in all the nooks and crannies. You would be surprised at the number of patients who didn't know that they were shot in weird places. For example, we're looking at underneath this guy's balls. He swore that there was only one gunshot in his arm. Yet when we pulled off his clothes and looked under his balls, there is another gunshot wound, okay? It's always important to know that these patients don't always know what's happening because of the adrenaline in their system. So always look between the butt cheeks, underneath the balls, in, in weird nooks and crannies, like the armpits and that kind of stuff to see what you can find. Next, we're gonna go ahead and log roll and you're gonna be checking the spine and rectal tone. We're looking for paralysis for rectal tone, but you're also checking the spine to see if you find any step offs where somebody has broken their spine or to find things like this, where you can see that there was another stab wound. That's probably an airway problem that we didn't know we had until we rolled the patient. And finally, we care a whole lot about temperature especially in older patients, because sometimes they can be hypo or hyperthermic. So you wanna make sure that you know what's going on with exposure. F is for fast. And some people say it's for finger stick glucose, but in a trauma, you care less about the glucose and more about the fast. So the, the only question that the fast is asking is, is there blood or fluid outside of where there should be? And you can see that I've gone through a fast scan here very quickly, but I wanted to make sure that you guys knew which probe to use on the fast scan. So the answer is you don't wanna use the linear probe array, which is the same one that you use to put in IV ultrasound. You wanna use either of the other two. Either of the other two are gonna give you the answers you want. So it doesn't matter which one of those two you use. There is gonna be a video later in this module that you're gonna to have to learn about the fast exam but for right now, I wanna show you what it's gonna look like to be positive. And you can see here that there is quite a lot of black, which is blood outside of the heart. That is a cardiac tamponade, not the best, don't recommend it. Um, that is a positive fast. The next one is gonna be the black fluid in Morrison's pouch, right in between the kidney and the liver. And you can see that black fluid right there. And then we're going to see black fluid outside of the bladder on the bottom or in the around the, the spleen in case it's been injured. Okay, so then the last final thing that we can do is we can ask about the only history that matters, and that's the ample history. Okay, so it stands for allergies, medications, especially coags right? We want to ask about past medical history or pregnancy. Remember, we don't care about hyperlipidemia, right? We want to know the big stuff. Do you have diabetes? Have you ever had a brain bleed? Are you pregnant? That kind of stuff. We want to ask about the last meal. Although in reality, we don't care if they're in here for an emergency. I don't care whether they've eaten recently or not. And then the last is E and that's all about events or the environment relating to the injury. Now, some people also add in their EMS history. So if you wanna do that, you can do that as well. We're gonna talk about that here in just a second. But the ample history is something that you need to know um, is only what you need to know if the person is suddenly gonna go unconscious. So you wanna ask them very quickly, very early on, especially if somebody else is running the trauma. If you go up at the head of the bed and you talk to the patient, this is the important pieces of information. 
Finally, the EMS stuff. Um, you guys probably know this because you've been nurses, but they don't teach it to us in medical school. So it's always important to talk to your, your paramedics before they leave the room. Even as the patient is getting an IV, even as they're being put onto the stretcher, you wanna know what the initial call was for, what the scene was like, and whether the person had SATs or blood pressure on scene and what they were, because that always matters at the beginning. Oops. So finally, we get to what to order in a trauma. And I'd like to say that we could all use our brains a little bit harder about this one. But the truth is, is that in most traumas, especially at a trauma one hospital, all of these orders are considered a trauma order set. And they're all ordered on every single patient. Notice that uh, the ones that are underlined in red are the only therapeutic options. So we get a CBC so we can look at the hemoglobin. We get a CMP to find out what kind of medical problems they have. We're going to get a typing screen in case they need more blood later. We're going to get a lactic. Why? I'm not really sure because most traumas are going to cause your lactic to be high. Then we're going to give a liter of fluid because we're assuming that if you were in a trauma, you're going to need it to support your blood pressure or your bleeding from somewhere. We're going to get a point of care pregnancy because that sounds like useful information that we need to know. We're going to give you pain medication because I'm assuming if you've had a trauma, you're going to be in pain. We're also going to get an INR and anticoags. That's something that a lot of people forget. And it's really, really important in trauma more than almost anything else, because we need to know if the INR is high for some reason. Maybe the person says, no, they're not on anticoagulation, but their INR is still 2.4. Maybe they have liver injury. That would be a really good thing to know. Next is we've probably already had a chest x-ray and a pelvic x-ray from A, B, and C. But in case we haven't, you still got to put in the order. So always remember that. And then lastly is the CT head. And this is called a trauma pan scan. So we're going to do a CT head without contrast, a CT cervical spine without contrast, and then a chest, abdomen, pelvis, or a cap with contrast. So notice that everything below the body is going to all have with contrast and everything above is going to be without. And we'll learn a little more about that later. Please don't send your trauma patient to the CT scanner if they are unstable. Most patients, as many of you know, go to the, the CT scan to die. And we don't really wanna do that. So if the patient is unstable still and they're not looking great, do not let them go to CT scan or at least go with them. Secondary survey is all algorithmic as well. You can see that this is a sheet that used to be what we used when we, there were T sheets out. Um, and the secondary survey part of this literally goes from head to toe and you're just supposed to check it off and say you couldn't find any abnormality. So you look at the head, you feel around, you look in the ears, you look in the eyes, you feel the facial bones, you get the point. Secondary survey is going to cover a lot of trauma signs and we're going to go through a few here shortly, but there are tons of trauma signs. You always want to look at things like neurovascular status of limbs. Notice that I have ignored that up until this point. We also want to talk about splinting. We want to look for entrapment. We want to care about imaging and labs, and we want to start thinking about what consults we need. Notice that this person is getting their tourniquet taken off because we want to evaluate and assess whether this thing needs uh, laceration repair or whether it's an arterial or venous bleed, that kind of stuff. So one of the things that we care about in the trauma spine, I'm sorry, the trauma evaluation secondary survey is clearing the C-spine. So this is the nexus criteria um, algorithm for clearing the C-spine. Notice that if they have anything like intoxication, you cannot just simply clear the C-spine by asking them if they have midline tenderness. Also notice that if you're in a car accident, especially a substantial one where you end up in the ER, you're going to have some lateral neck pain from the muscles that have snapped back and refrained your head from completely going all the way back. Lateral neck pain is different than midline neck pain. So please remember that. I'm going to let you look at this at your 
pleasure, I guess. Um, this is some criteria that you should know if you don't already. This um, MCRIT podcast um, logo in the very, very bottom is a podcast that I got this uh, photo from. So if you're interested, you could probably check that out. Next is the signs of a basilar skull fracture or a basilar skull fracture, however you want to say that. Um, most skull fractures of the base are actually missed in most head CTs, up to 20%, which is kind of a lot. So if you notice raccoon eyes where you see the, it almost looks like they got punched in the face and both eyes are black. If you see something like hemotympanum or you see battle sign where they have bruising on the back mastoid process or even tenderness or pain. Maybe they have something dripping out of their ear or their nose and it drops onto the tissue and you see a halo sign. All of those indicate that this person has a skull fracture and that's a really big deal. It's almost 100% clinical, so you need to remember this. The way that we're going to image it and prove it is that we're gonna get a temporal head CT, which is a special kind of head CT different than your usual regular head. CT. Next is a bunch of neck injuries. And you're going to have a lot of modules on neck injuries because it is a big problem. So you want to know that the neck injuries are done in zones, which is what this middle picture shows. Notice that it goes from the bottom to the top. So zone one is by, by your chest, zone two and zone three. Zone one is pretty scary because that's where all of your blood vessels are. But zone two is the most scary because it's smaller. There's less space. So it's easier to have a problem in zone two than it is any of the rest of the areas because of the clavicle and the jaw, which protects the other areas. So if you have a problem in zone two, do not put your finger in it. Don't put a Q-tip in it. Know that zone two, almost always you need to call surgery for. I also want to point out to you some of the pictures on the right side of the screen, which show you seatbelt sign. Seatbelt sign can either be across the waist or across the neck from the seatbelt. Remember that in these car accidents, that seatbelt can really push on areas. You can see in the little boy on the with his stomach that a seatbelt in that area can probably cause a bowel perforation or it can cause some significant bleeding in either the aorta or any of the other vasculature down in that area. Same is gonna be true of seatbelt sign on the neck. That can cause things like a carotid artery dissection. It can cause that carotid to burst. It can cause lots of problems. So if you have a seatbelt sign, be sure to document it where it is maybe even take a picture of it and be very aware. Another trauma sign to be um, aware of is blood at the meatus. So you can see that this is a picture of blood at the meatus. Um, being that a lot of you were nurses, I'm sure you know that blood at the meatus means that they probably have a ureteral injury and that ureteral injury means don't put a Foley in that, <laughs> especially in the terms of trauma. I also want to point out another urinary, uh, urinary sign that a lot of people talk about, which is an erection in the, in the setting of trauma. Um, I've seen nurses and students and other people kind of laugh when a male comes in and has this weird erection going on um, after a car accident or something. And it's something that's usually pretty obvious but it's not something to laugh at because an erection in the setting of trauma almost always means that it's the last hurrah. It almost always means that they have the spine that has broken and they're going paralyzed. So it's probably the last erection they will ever get. And it's definitely not something to laugh about. And it's not something to jump to conclusions about too. It's always something that all the providers in the room are gonna look at each other with very worried glances. So please be aware of this. Last of course is gonna be the tertiary survey. The tertiary survey is doing all of the things that we think about later. Things like talking to the patient and telling them what we saw in the scans or finding the family and telling them you also want to reassess the patient again, right? Because it's the tertiary survey. 
um, not just looking them up and down, checking their vital signs, but see how the pain is. Splint the extremity that's broken. Consider laceration repairs or stapling, right? Get them a warm blanket because their clothes are cut off and they're exposed everywhere. Make sure that you have your console called and recommended. Try to decide on whether you think this patient needs to be admitted or whether they're okay to be discharged. And don't forget to do all of your charting. I recommend, especially on trauma patients, at least get something in the chart because you're gonna want to finish that before you move on to other patients. So from here, I wanna take you through a quick case. So it's the patient picture that we had above. We have a guy who was in a car accident. He was injected unrestrained and the passenger in the other vehicle died, which tells you this was a very serious car accident. So we don't want to make a mistake like a total noob rookie and get very interested in what's going on with his legs because we're in charge of this trauma, which means we're going to start our ABCs. Notice that there are other residents and patients and nurses, and there's even somebody at the head of the bed. So we're going to be in charge of this. So we're going to start with our A and our B. What you can do is you can ask him to talk, or you can also notice that he has a face mask on and he's not intubated. So we can say, hey, is he awake? Is he breathing okay? We don't necessarily need the monitor for this stage, but we want to have them start putting it on. We wanna start getting that IV. We wanna ask some questions. We also wanna get that chest X-ray. So everybody is gonna move away and let us get the chest X-ray. Do you see anything wrong with this chest X-ray? I don't know if you noticed it, but the lungs are okay. However, they have a scapular fracture. This is what a normal scapula is supposed to look like. And this one is definitely broken. That looks like it hurts. Don't forget that you cannot get distracted by just looking at the lungs when you get that x-ray. Look at the bones too. Okay. Now we got to go back to our patient and we need to get our circulation. So notice that one of the first things that we're going to get is we're going to get some vital signs. Okay. So we have our vital signs that are borderline hypotensive and tachycardic. So we know what that means. This patient might be going into shock. We probably need to start looking at things like our, sorry, that's my phone again. <laughs> we probably need to look at things like is he perfusing? What does his cap refill look like? Maybe we should start some fluids, right? Okay, so we got the patient on the monitor, we got them IVs, we got them on fluids, and we have an x-ray of the pelvis uh, where you can see his belt buckle and zipper, which are really helpful. <laughs> Um, but if we follow that circular, circular line, like I showed you earlier, you can see that, that you can follow the line and you can follow the outside W. So I don't think that this patient has any fractures that I can see, not in the pelvis. So we can move on from here. Next, we're going to go to D and we're going to do our Glasgow coma scale. This person has an open eye response. They're blinking. They're talking at you, so they're at least a four, and they are obeying commands. So they're probably gonna be a GCS of 14 or 15, depending on what their verbal responses are. Notice that we're also gonna take a look at our pupils in this stage, right? And it looks like the pupils are about the same size, so I'm not gonna be spending too much more time on that. We're also gonna be doing some exposure. So notice there's a handy dandy pair of scissors sitting right there, right next to this guy's pants. And it looks like he's still wearing underwear. So we need to cut off the rest of that. We need to look for what else is going on. So let's cut off the pants. Let's expose this patient as much as we can. That might also mean that we have to take off the straps for his lower extremities to see what else is going on there. We also find in his pants pocket, he's got a bunch of weed. It's important for you to know, and you probably do as a nurse, that if you find any drug paraphernalia, if you find a gun, if you find anything like that, you have to report it and give it to the campus police. You cannot leave a gun or any drug paraphernalia in the room with the patient. 
And lastly, with exposure, you want to make sure somebody holds C-spine and you want to roll the patient. We want to feel down the spine to see if we feel any cracks, crevices, or step-offs. And then we also have to decide if we need to do a rectal. Then we're going to go to our fast. But a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't do fast first. What we need to do is fluids and some pain medication. Because remember, this guy isn't doing very well. I also want to make sure you know from our pain medications lecture earlier that you probably shouldn't be giving this patient morphine because we don't want to drop their pressure. Oh, wait, look at that blood pressure. It's already dropped and the heart rate has gone significantly higher. We probably need to activate the blood transfusion massive blood transfusion protocol. And we might even need to put this patient on the pads to get, care, to get ready for everything that might go down. So our next step is gonna to be to talk to the patient and get our ample history and order that blood. We're gonna put in very quickly our lab and imaging orders just to get something to start with. Remember that if you're starting to run out of time, like you are with this patient, I always kind of cheat and order an ABG. If the nurses or the respiratory therapists can get an ABG, they'll have some of the labs on the bottom of that ABG, and that'll give me a little clue on what's going on with the patient and if I need to be worried or not. Then if everything calms down, we can start doing our secondary survey and getting some consultants down into the department, especially surgery, because we're really worried about those legs, right? My guess is a car probably hit him. He was probably a pedestrian and that's why he has those leg injuries. Finally, let's talk about a few trauma myths. Again, you may know this, you may not, but unlike TV and every awesome detective show ever, the bullet stays in the body like most of the time. I don't know and I'm still confused as to why most people say when somebody gets shot that you need to dig in and cut around and pull out the bullet to fix the problem. That is just going to make the person bleed more and have more of a terrible laceration. I don't understand why this is necessary and it shouldn't be done unless it's in a very few small amount of cases like it's in a place that we don't want it to be. Uh, like say in the heart and it's pumped around the body. I've seen that a couple times, probably not the best. Uh, that said, most of the time you wanna leave the bullet in the body. Don't go digging around for it unless it's really obviously coming out at you. Also, surgeons don't come into the ER or to the ambulance bay to wait for patients very often unless there's a big trauma that's been called and even then, doesn't happen often. So expect to be the person that's handling the trauma first. The ABCs and that golden hour is probably going to be you and you're probably going to have to call the surgeon down. Next is don't spend a lot of time with a patient that is conscious asking why. You don't want to know what this patient was doing to get shot. Frankly, it's not your business. Most of the time they lie about it and they won't tell you all the story anyway. If you do get the bullet out of the patient, you have to put it in a baggie and it has to be submitted to the police. Now, another question for you. What is the most commonly missed fracture? The answer is the second one, because almost everybody gets really focused in on one thing about a patient. Like if a patient comes in with a ripped off leg, everybody looks at the leg and a lot of people, they forget to look at the vital signs. They forget to look at the patient. The patient could even go unconscious and everybody's looking at the leg and they're not noticing what's happening with the patient or they don't notice the giant stab wound on the back of the guy. So it's always important with this question to look at for other fractures or other injuries. Remember as the leader, don't focus on the most obvious problem, right? Put a tourniquet on that thing and look at the rest of the body. If you can get everybody else focused, a lot of times your patients will do better. Finally, we got to talk a little bit about pediatric trauma. Now I know you're going to have a little bit more information on this later, but pediatric kids, well, peds are kids, sorry about that. Kids have more of a reserve which means they're fine, 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 fine until suddenly they're not and they're crashing and oh my gosh. 
So that means that a lot of times their vital signs and their consciousness, they're not going to crash super fast. Like they're not going to come in and slowly decline like an adult might. They're going to be fine until suddenly they're really not fine. It's very quick. So always be suspicious of a pediatric kid. Even I said pediatric kid again, I'm sorry. Always be suspicious of a peds trauma, even if their vitals are fine, even if they look fine, remember that they have a high potential to just crash suddenly. Also pediatric vitals are kind of the bane of my existence. I really hate math. I really hate calculating all of the kilograms. I hate calculating whether it's an appropriate heart rate for that patient or whether they need a certain size tube. So somebody somewhere has appreciated that and made something called the Braslow pediatric tape. I'm sure you know about this, but in case you don't, if you have a kid, always ask for the Braslow tape or know where it is in your department. Because if you can lay the kid down and you can measure the tape, it'll give you all of the drugs, all of the codes, all of the calculations are already done for you. The only calculation that I have memorized, just in case I need it, is that fluid resuscitation for children is 20 mLs per kg. So this can be used for fluid, and blood is usually about 15 mLs per kg. So you can put those two together if you want to, and just remember, if you need to resuscitate, that's where you go. I also want to give you the warning that Having been in many peds traumas, emotions are always high. It's always high, not just in the onlookers, not just in the parents, but also in the staff. We always have nursing crying and everybody wants to look and the respiratory therapists and people who aren't involved in the case want to come watch and pain is undertreated. Things get missed. It's always crazy. There's always more family members than there needs to be. Maybe the police is involved. It's always a, a messy social situation. I have seen in many traumas that this messy social situation can get in the way of actually treating the patient. So if this gets out of hand, you need to have the parents escorted out, call campus security very soon, or at least put them in a corner, or don't let the social situation distract you, the provider, from taking care of the patient. It doesn't matter whether the daddy shot him or the mommy shot him or whatever happened, just focus on the patient first and come up with the story later when you know the kid is not about to crash on you. I also wanna make sure that you define the roles in pediatric trauma. Even nurses who have been doing things really well for years and years and years can get very distracted or very easily rattled by pediatric trauma, which means that you as the provider need to not be that person. You have to step back emotionally. And sometimes that's the hardest part of pediatric trauma. We also have to talk about, and we're gonna learn a whole lot more about pediatric non-accidental trauma. You're going to learn all the signs and symptoms of what is okay and what is not okay for a kid in what age and where. In general though, you must be the person to contact CPS or you must be the person to tell social work to contact CPS. Don't rely on the nurses to do it. Um, lots of people have been burned. If you're the one that's suspicious, you got to do it. And it's really easy to go online, log in and submit a report. I'm not gonna go into all of the stuff, but please be aware of it. The next thing that I hope you're aware of, but in case you're not, is head injuries in children. They have one for older than two years, but this is the one for under two years. This is one of the biggest studies ever conducted, except for maybe some of the COVID studies, but it's the biggest one on trauma and it's pediatric trauma under two years old, who should be CT'd and who should not. Not only does this come in handy in the emergency department, but for any of you who have friends and family who constantly text you asking you, should I send my child to the ER? This is such a handy tool because you can send this to anybody or I send some of my patients home with it, the patient parent, of course, saying this is how we decide whether they need to get a CT scan or not. Please be familiar with this. There are tons and tons of pictures on this on Google if you don't like this particular one. <coughs> Finally, some pregnant trauma. Again, just an overview. We're not gonna get bogged down into the details. 
For most of pregnant trauma, we're going to pretend like the patient isn't pregnant and we're going to treat them like we usually would. I'm going to give all the same medications that I usually would, including things like blood transfusions, fluids, pain medication, all of it. Remember that if the mom doesn't live or if she's in a lot of stress, that could potentially lead to the demise of the fetus. Also know that left lateral position can save you, especially if the mom's having some vascular or bleeding problems. Next is fundal height. That's what this picture is all about. The secret to know with fundal height is that if you can touch the belly button and you feel the very tip of the uterus at the belly button, you know it's 20 weeks or larger. At 20 weeks or more, that baby is most likely salvageable. So if mom tanks, you have five minutes or less to cut that baby out to save its life. You will not have five minutes and two seconds. You will only have five minutes. There's no time for hesitation. If you feel the fundus at the belly button, do the cut. Definitely call for your attending. Definitely call for surgery or OB or anybody else who can. Make sure the nurses can. But if you got to do it with ungloved hands and a scalpel, you got to do it. You do not have time to play this game. So the secret is that fundal height at the umbilicus. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. And elderly trauma. So just like kids who have a higher reserve because they crash real suddenly, the elderly have a lower reserve. And it has a lot to do with many things. The truth is our bodies just give out. Our organs are tired. We also have so many drugs, polypharmacy. We have a lot of comorbidities. We have lower immunity. And that just makes elderly patients in general a lot more complex. A lot of them are on anticoagulations, which means they bleed easier and they're more sensitive to even minor trauma. So this person probably fell off a chair and that could still be serious hip injury or a big head bleed where it wouldn't be if this person was 30. You got to remember that because everything is old and more fragile, you have to be more suspicious of bigger injuries in elderly patients. I also want you to be aware that they don't metabolize pain medication like everyone else does, which may mean that you need to give lower doses of pain medicines. And they're going to have a lot of polypharmacy, so they may have a lot of interactions that you need to be aware of. Or they may not even be able to give us a history because they're demented. So there's a lot of factors that go into elderly trauma. Now, I know you guys are tired of hearing me talk. But all of this is just the tip of the iceberg, as many of you know, if you've already worked in the emergency departments. But this was just supposed to be a broad overview. There's a lot of things that we're going to go into in detail in this module later. And we're going to have faculty members who are going to go over a lot of the same material in different ways. So you understand all of our thought processes on how to deal with trauma.